Hello and welcome to In The Wall with me, Parker Kligerman. This is the U.S. Motorsports Show about all motorsports, where we dive deeper into the conversations on the internet. Be a part of this show using hashtag In The Wall. But first, the news. In Formula One, Stoffel Van Dorn has been named as a test and reserve driver for Aston Martin next year. He previously split the same role with Nick DeVries at Mercedes, but with DeVries getting a full-time drive at AlphaTauri, the Merck reserve seat now needs to be filled. Daniel Ricciardo has been linked with the Mercedes reserve spot earlier. Is this his landing spot to stay in F1? We'll see. Also in F1, the series has reportedly changed plans for how they will handle tire blankets next season. Uh, you know those things that go on the tires and heat them up? Well, the blankets are going away entirely in 2024 to save energy and change up some design. But the original plan for this transition year was to run the blankets at 20 degrees cooler. Doesn't sound that big. This was tested in Austin and wasn't particularly popular with Lando Norris saying that everyone's going to shunt their car. Hmm. Pirelli did a different test in Mexico where the tires were heated at the original temp for a shorter time period and found it saved the same amount of energy without cold tire side effects. So that's the plan for next year currently, but teams are still going to have to prepare for that 2024 regulation change where they'll join the rest of the racing world and like IndyCar in having cold tires. Good luck to them. Uh, in WEC, Ferrari has revealed the race livery for the Le Mans car that will run Le Mans in 2023. And we're just a group of car appreciators here on In The Wall, so let's just take a second to appreciate how incredibly pretty this race car is. I saw they took it for a couple laps at Imola, and it just is awesome, and I like pretty cars. Uh, and on the season finale of Keeping Up With The McLarens, I know, sad, Chip Ganassi may have won Alex Pillow's services for next year, but McLaren has the last laugh. Not only is it wildly rumored that they'll get Pillow once his current contract is up, but they've swiped the chief sponsor of the number 10 car in NTT data for next year. Tony Kanaan will also be joining McLaren from, from Chip Ganassi as their fourth driver for the Indy 500. What is it between those two? <laughs> what a battle. <laughs> Just, hey, if you can't have that, we'll take this then. All right, see you later. Uh, and in MotoGP, it will also be wrapping up their season this weekend at Valencia. Peko Bagnaia currently sits 23 points clear of defending champ Fabio Quattararo, and needs to finish 15th or better to seal the championship. Bagnaia is attempting to finish the largest comeback in MotoGP history. At one point, he was 91 points down in the title race. If he manages to seal the title, it'll also be the rider's first championship for Ducati in 15 years. The title decider will air on NBC at 11 a.m. Sunday, right before the pre-show for the NASCAR Cup finale. So, what better way to start your Sunday than with a little MotoGP Finale. That would be awesome. Um, and in Phoenix, after 38 weeks, one of the craziest seasons in recent memory in NASCAR, we are set for a wild finish. Joey Logano and Chase Elliott will both be trying for their second title, while Ross Chastain and Christopher Bell are looking for their first. Bell has been clutched this season with eliminations on the line, winning twice in must-win situations, something only Kevin Harvick has managed and the first person to ever do it twice in one season. Logano, as the first one to win his way into the champ, has had the longest time to prepare out of all of them. We'll see if that helps. Chase Elliott's postseason hasn't been the flashiest, but it's been steadily good the whole way. And if Chastain manages to win the championship without winning the race, he'll tie for the least amount of wins by a series champ in a season. Don't they say you have to win to win the championship? But whatever happens, he's sure to be flashy. Statistically, Chase Elliott has the best average finish of the group at Phoenix. Ross Chastain was second here in March. And Logano has the most top tens of the four, which is key because you might not have to win this year. We'll just get into that later. With only five cup starts at Phoenix, Bell is the least experienced here, but we can't count any of them out. In a season that's been nothing but chaos, it'd be fitting for the last race of the year to give us a wild finish and maybe, and this is the one I love, break our record 20th winner, which will be awesome. Here's the crew's picks for this weekend. We were tragically wrong last time when we tried to make picks for the IndyCar uh, series. So congrats to whoever we don't pick on winning the championship. Uh, so with, for these few names, we're just sorry, but it's over for you. Uh, Emily says, Joe Logano because he's from Connecticut. Wow, her research is incredible. Cat, our producer and lovely producer. Christopher Bell because of his ability to show up clutch. Thank you for actually putting some 
actual thought in that. And I'm going to say Joey Logano mm, because I've been assigned to him in the pits. And when he won in 2018, I was assigned to him in the pits. That's, that's my reasoning. <laughs> we'll see if that goes anywhere. Good luck to Joey Logano. Um, now, back at Martinsville, we have to talk about Ross Chastain's move. It was incredible, right? It has had the whole world talking about it. I was standing there on pit road. I'm looking, and suddenly I hear the crowd cheer, and I don't exactly know why. And I look, and I see that Chastain has gone side by side with Hamlin, crossed the start finish line, and I think to myself, well, how in the world did that happen? Then there was a replay. The crowd erupts once again when they see the replay, and I realize what he had done which is unbelievable. But I wasn't the only one who thought this because I want to talk about some of the numbers around the social media reaction. Just from our post over here at NBC, it blew up. It's the most viewed video on the NASCAR and NBC Twitter, Twitter account ever with 10 and a half million views and counting. Just that one clip has outpaced what the NASCAR and Sunday Night Football accounts normally do in a week. It's also the most engaged with tweet of 2020 of 2022 on the NASCAR and NBC account by a factor of seven. And that's just the Twitter numbers. It's eclipsed 10 million views on TikTok and the videos on our YouTube channel about it are at a combined 1.1 million views. It's one of the biggest moments in sports this year on NBC across all our data outpacing things like the NFL and the Olympics. And we've seen everyone from F1 drivers to football commentators talk about how cool it was. What's awesome about this is it's not just NASCAR fans consuming this clip. It's fans of other motorsports and people aren't fans of the sport at all or weren't until now. I love that. This is the kind of awesome moment that grabs people's attention and makes them curious about what the sport is all about. There are going to be people who tune into Phoenix for their very first NASCAR race just because of this. So we have a question for you. Is this the most viral NASCAR moment of the decade? because we think it is. All I know is, and then there's this. Does this unpack what's going on here? Oh Oh. yes, horrible moment then for James Goldie. And then all this lot have got nowhere to go. They have literally arrived in the middle of a gigantic accident. So it starts with James Golding tripping over right here, gets it crossed up, launches across the top of the kerb, lucky not to roll it, and that has had the effect of tripping over Randall, and then the rest of them are all doing 150 kilometres an hour, and they drive smack bang into the middle of a gigantic mess. Can I just say I love Surfer's Paradise, and I love the Supercar Series. With that, I want to talk about horsepower. It's championship week in NASCAR, but one of the Cup Series championship owners has caused quite a stir on Twitter. Justin Marks, who is the co-owner of Trackhouse, quote tweeted a clip about how fast the NASCAR Cup cars looked at Texas in 2014, back when there was high downforce and 850 plus horsepower. The last year of this level of engine performance, and when you look at the videos, he has a point. You can visibly see how fast the cars are going. So, well, you know, into the corner was over 200 miles an hour. Having driven those cars, I can tell you they were absolutely fire-breathing monsters that made you realize you were at the highest level of stock car racing. The difference between the power of the first cup car I drove in 2009 and the next-gen car I drove this year at Gateway is probably close to a 300 horsepower difference. It's been noticeable. Yet when I look at this car, and often I think it looks like such a fire-breathing monster with this dual exhaust, but then it lacks the power punch to live up to its awesome look. But here's the thing. I think on the bigger tracks, speed does not equal ticket sales in this day and age. I know it looks awesome, but we all know we have the tech to go far faster than a human can drive. But for the short tracks, road courses and smaller tracks, there has definitely been something lost by having only 675 horsepower in these cup cars. For example, at Martinsville this past weekend, it took to around lap 50 or later for the cars to start sliding around. I sat there and thought, could 300 more horsepower make that happen earlier? I don't know, but I'd love to find out. Justin then tweeted he would like to see a five car test of the next gen car with 850 plus horsepower at Charlotte this off season, just to see what happens. I know the drivers will all get out and me included, and think, that's the way. I think that's it, we found it. But as we know, it's not always that simple. I'll end with this. 
I think we've discovered that one big neg negative to lowering the horsepower is the drivers being less excited to drive the car. If the gain in the show is minuscule or not existent, new manufacturers haven't joined, let's get the horsepower back and make these cars the fire-breathing monsters they look like they are. Come on, let's do it. Bring horsepower back. Let's make them slide around and be something that you can only see in the NASCAR Cup Series. Um, our last story of the day comes from F1, where the title may be over, but the drama is of course not because it's the world's fastest reality show. Red Bull has decided they will not be participating in Sky's F1 coverage anymore, following a piece that aired during the U.S. Grand Prix where commentators described Lewis Hamilton as, quote, robbed of the 2021 title. Max Verstappen told reporters the boycott was due to feeling disrespected by Sky, saying that they, quote, keep disrespecting me, and at one point, I'm not tolerating it anymore. That's why I decided to stop answering them. Here's the thing. I get being upset. I've been there as a driver. I get the feeling that there is bias. I've also been there. But I've also been on this side of being the commentator. And what I've learned through both sides of battles like this in NASCAR is that the only ones who lose are you, the fans. For every Lewis fan, there's probably a Max Verstappen fan who is now losing out on hearing from their favorite driver. And lastly, the Sky broadcast is watched by a majority of the U.S. fans. And before you bring out F1 TV, streaming numbers are far smaller than terrestrial television. So really, what he's done here and what Red Bull is doing is not really hurting Sky. It's not hurting the other broadcasters. It's just hurting you, the fans, and not getting his side of the story on the broadcast you're watching. I think that's a fail. They need to fix that immediately. As always, this show is all about you. So use hashtag in the wall to get on this very show like some of these fine folks uh, that we found on Instagram. Derek Seller said, I think it's fair. My question is, do you think that NASCAR should have budget caps and how do you think that could affect the sport when we were talking about the uh, F1 budget cap situation where they penalize Red Bull? So in NASCAR, this has been discussed for probably over five years at the cup level. It has been incredibly hard to get many of the owners to agree to what the correct number would be, first of all, what that number would be between 16 million, 18 million, 22 million. What do you include and what do you not include? Do you include driver salaries? Usually that's a no. Do you include executive salaries and that sort of thing? Usually that's a no. Do you, you know, how do you factor in getting engines from a manufacturer or their help and all those sorts of things? So it's an incredibly complicated thing to put a budget cap into a motorsport series, which is why so many series, including NASCAR, probably the closest, are watching what's happening in Formula One because they've been able to do this and we wanna see sort of how this all works out. I think there is a faction within NASCAR that want it to happen. I also think there are groups that think it's not necessary because there's almost a natural cap in NASCAR, especially the new next gen car, being that you can only do so much to it. You can't really develop the car. You can only spend so much. So. I think that's sort of where the sport sits at the moment with it. Um, do I think it eventually comes? Most likely. I think something in this fashion or form happens. Um, but I also think you have a lot of teams who are obviously looking to just get more income from the sport uh, and less trying to cut themselves in what they spend. So it's an interesting time. But I think what's going on in Formula 1 has been really key for everyone to watch. And we'll see where it goes from there. Uh, Randall Martin Jr. said, unless it's a safety issue, why should NASCAR get involved? Racing around the track using a different line? If it's a safety issue, ban it from the tracks with openings in the wall like you can't pass below the yellow line at Dega and Daytona. He's referencing the Ross Chastain move at Martinsville where I immediately felt like that was awesome. I loved it. It was the coolest thing I've seen in a long, long time. But I think NASCAR probably has to do something because all I can see in my mind is going there in the spring of this next year and having three or four cars fighting for the win. And then on the last lap, they all go into turn three and four and slide up and smash through the wall and try to outrun each other on the wall. That's not gonna be a good look. Um, and I just think, you know, as a sport, it's one of these moments that will most likely create a rule change, create a difference in how we, you know, officiate those sorts of things in the future. Um, but it, you know, was fully in the rules when it happened and that's awesome. So I just don't want to see this become the norm and more of the, obviously the exception. So we'll see where that goes. But I, I, I do think they have to do something. Um, this is a name I don't even know how to say, PB Klingensmith. Hey, it's almost like my name. If NASCAR does anything other than add ball bearings to the walls, 
they are idiots. <laughs> I think you just got my answer on that. We're not asking, adding ball bearings to the walls and letting everyone run around on them. But, hey, maybe that'd be kind of fun. I don't know. Interesting. Um, you may have noticed the shirt I'm wearing. This was because the biggest news in all of racing that shook the motorsports world happened this past Saturday when it was announced that I will be the full-time driver of the number 48 Big Machine uh, big machine vodka, spiked core, Chevy, and the NASCAR Xfinity Series racing for the championship next year. I'm super excited, but what does that mean for us here on In the Wall? Well, this is our last regular season episode, but we will and we intend to continue bringing you some episodes through the off season and especially some cool specials. So we're going to talk IMSA, Formula E, the history of super speedways, and this is my personal favorite how hard it is to break seven championships in a top-level motorsport series, and really anything you find really cool and worth your time. So keep an eye out for those later in this month and send in your suggestions of what you think we could dive into in this offseason. Um, with that, have a great time watching Phoenix. I hope it will be a tremendous finale, and maybe you'll see a car use the wall, but hopefully not. With that, I'm off to Phoenix. See you later.